and gentlemen. It's such a great privilege. We've had a great conference. We had something called the 10-minute marriage conference. No, it wasn't 10 minutes, but it was a great marriage conference. And, and uh, I'm going to ask that, uh, Dr. Doug Weiss and his lovely wife, Lisa, are here today. And so, Lisa, could you stand up real quick? We're going to give you a big old hi. Say hi to Lisa. She, uh, I've talked to her for years. I finally got a chance to meet her. She does a great job at Heart to Heart Counseling and helps run the office and, and all does a great job. And she's been tremendous in helping us plan this weekend. And uh, so we had a great time yesterday. And Dr. Doug Weiss has uh, been uh, is, a, is a doctor of counseling. He's also an ordained minister as well. And uh, he's got a tremendous practice in Colorado Springs. He's been on Dr. Phil Oprah Lifetime, had a movie about him, about his work. And so he does a great opportunity for help, helping people to realize the freedom that they can find in Christ and how to help set people free of addictions and also to help marriages go to the next level. How many people know that marriages in our country need a lot of help? It's an important thing. And so it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege for us to bring people in every year to help you to work on your marriage and me to work on my marriage. Why? Because it's an important thing that God has called us to do. We should be, I believe this, we should be the, um, uh, if you will, the oasis of marriages in our society today. That when people see us, they can find out the way to do it. Because God has a great opportunity for us to be helping others to become to know. So when God gives you a good marriage, it's just not for you only. It's to be a help to others. Amen. And so at Cornerstone, we want to make sure everyone can grow and be leaders in society to help other people know Christ. And the purpose they have for not only for the family, but for the marriages. Would you please welcome back to Cornerstone Church, Dr. Doug Weiss. All right. Well, thank you, Pastor Eric. Bless you. All right. Well, good morning. And it is, uh, it's really good to be back. You know, I've been here several times, and I love watching your, your family grow. And you like your new building, right? Amen. I love it. It's awesome. And, you know, God's giving you more responsibility. He's calling you to more. He's, he's blessing you. And I, I think this is an amazing thing. And uh, really uh, watching, you know, uh, Pastor Eric and Sandra just mature and grow. It's just awesome to see what the Lord is doing here in, in this area. Amen? Amen? Amen. It's an honor to be a part of that. Now, I want to talk to you this morning about what we call the final creation. And I don't know if you've ever gone to a movie, or maybe you, let's, I'll have you raise your hands here a second. How many of you have gone to a movie, and in the movie, they show you the end first? And then they back trail for the rest of the hour and a half, and they move you back to that moment. Does that make sense? Okay, so this morning, I want to kind of take that approach into showing you something in the Word of God uh, about marriage. So it's kind of a revelation that God showed me. And I've written several marriage books, and there's several out there on the book table. You can meet Miss Lisa out there and all that. But it's really important for us to get kind of a God concept of marriage, like what God really did in this whole process, because he did an amazing thing in marriage. And oftentimes, when we think about, you know, God creating in the garden, you know, we go to Genesis and we see what he did. You know, if I ask you, what was the last, what was the last thing that God created in the garden? Your mind would automatically go to a wrong answer. Your mind would go to Eve. But that wasn't his final creation. And I know girls always get upset when I do that. Like, wait a minute, wait a minute. That was our, that was our thing, man. <laughs> okay, but it really, that's not the way it was. Okay, I need you guys, why don't you two come up here real quick? You two. You're married, right? No. You're not married. <laughs> Stay seated. I need a married couple. Give me a married couple. You're married? Okay, then come up here, please. Thank you for being honest. Okay, so what's your names? Maria. Maria? Ricardo. Ricardo, come over here. Either way. Okay, so Ricardo and Maria, right? Okay, so, so first, God went through the process of making, you know, Ricardo. He made man first, right? Yes? Maybe more hair, but you look kind of like this. No, he's shaving. I can tell he's got lots of hair up there. He's just, he's just eating. Okay, so then, and then he made woman, Right? Okay, now if you could grab your exterior hands out there like that. Put your hands together. No, just like that. Okay. Okay. And then he brought them together with himself. Come here, hands. And then he made his final creation. This was his final creation. Marriage was the final creative act of God. 
a three-faced being, serving, loving, being together, a trinity on earth as it is in heaven. This was his final creation. Amen? Amen. Amen. Give them a hand. Now, see, if you don't understand that, you can operate off of secular definitions. And, you know, the secular culture will tell you that marriage is between a man and a woman. Marriage has never been between a man and a woman. It's always been between God, a man, and a woman. Marriage was created by God. It is sustained through God. And it is to please God. Amen? Okay? So when you, when you look at marriage, marriage is a trinity on earth as it is in heaven. And you can tell... You know, when, when God created Adam, he looked kind of like man. I mean, God, man kind of looked like God, okay? But the devil didn't attack Adam, and he had lots of time to attack him, right? Eve was created, and there was a season between being created and being brought to Adam. He didn't attack her. But see, when he brought them together and he made his trinity on earth, that he attacked. That looked a lot like what he saw in heaven for thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years. This three-faced being loving and serving each other with the ability to reproduce. This was dangerous. Amen? Okay? So see, we're supposed to be that trinity on earth so that the sauce that our children grow up in is not a sauce between a man and a woman. It's between God and man and a woman. I'm saying there's plenty of times when me and Lisa were raising our children. We say, well, we don't really know. We're going to go pray about it tonight. Now, if you ever want to teach your children to pray, do that. Because you think you're praying for a solution? They're interceding. God, if you really exist, please turn my mom's heart or my dad's heart. Let my dad listen to my mom so I don't get hit. Please. Okay. See, they're supposed to know there's another person in the room. Amen? So that's the end. That's the final act. That's the creator's masterpiece. His final genius was not woman, although she's complicated as she is. Marriage is much more than that. Amen? Because three people will have to become one. Three people have to figure life out. Three people are on a journey Okay, now when you understand that, now I'm going to take you back. Okay, we now we know what God's up to in the creative story. We know what his his genius is about. His genius is about creating a trinity on earth as it is in heaven. That's his genius. He's like, I'm going to create a family. I'm going to be a part of that family. I'm going to do it on earth. I'm going to create an earth. I'm going to have fun. Right, and so he did. So let's walk back through creation. Because I want to walk you through a principle of God in creation. And then I want to walk you through an exception. See, sometimes God operates by exception, and sometimes he operates by principle. Aren't we glad he does both? Because if it was only principle, some of us would be in trouble. <laughs> but sometimes he operates by exception. And when I show you this exception, it may help you to understand a lot about marriage, and a lot about us, and a lot about the church of Jesus Christ, and a lot about changing the world. Okay, you all excited? Yes. You look excited, okay. <laughs> the other crowd had more caffeine than you did, I can tell, just by, just by the, the eyes, you know, they, they were more dilated, okay? Now, I'm just playing. I wanna, let's go back to creation's story, okay? Now, in, in Genesis chapter one, and I'm gonna walk you through the entire creative story really rapidly, okay, at light speed. So if you have your Bible, you can go there and be really quick, okay? And God said, let there be light, and there was? Light. Right, there was light. He said it, it was. Then in verse 6, and God said, let there be an expanse between the waters and separate the waters from water. And so God made the expanse and separate the water. So he said it, it was. And he called the expanse sky. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered to one place and let the dry ground appear. And it was so. God said it. It happened. Okay. And God said, let there be lights in the expanse of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them serve as signs to make seasons and days. And then we have the, the stars and the sky and all that. Uh, God made the two great lights. So, you know, bang, they were. 
Okay, and God said, let the waters teem with living creatures. Let the birds fly above the earth across the expanse of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, etc. And God said, now I'm in verse 24, let the land produce living creatures according... Oh, I think I missed something. I missed the, uh, the vegetables. But God said, let there be vegetables and green things. And there was, okay. <laughs> See, God, what God was doing, he was creating the environment for his masterpiece. Like a, like a person building a house. Oh, they're going to need plumbing. Oh, they're going to need electricity. Oh, they're going to need a refrigerator. Oh, they're going to need a roof. So he created this amazing roof called the sky. And he decorated it with cars, stars and the sky and moon. Okay? Then he made this whole place of vegetation that we could have to eat salads. And then for those who were going to like fish, he made fish. And for those who were going to like meat, meat. Amen? I mean, it's good. God is good. See, he thinks ahead. He's a, he prepares before us, okay? And then he made livestock for those who like beef and, and creatures that move along the ground and all that, and they were. And then God said, let us make man in our own image and in our own likeness and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock of over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Now, follow the principle for a moment. God says it, it happens, okay? It, you know, so that's an amazing principle because when you see God at work, it's like, okay, he says, you know, let's do this, and it's done. God never had a honey-do list from the Holy Spirit because when he saw it, he did it. That's just an asterisk, guys, okay? In our house, if you see it, you do it. When I was a pastor of a church, we had, a, we had, a, we had this kind of principle, Eric. It's a, uh, you know how people like to, well, pastor, we should do this. We should do that. Remember, you know that? Well, we had this principle in our, in our church. If you see it, you do it. Oh, we should have a team ministry. Go for it. You're assigned. It's amazing how many people didn't feel called after that. <laughs> okay? But the people truly called who did it. And sometimes God is showing you something and you should be about doing it because that's why God is showing it to you. Because he's showing it to you so that it gets done on earth as it is in heaven. And he's assigning you the privilege of seeing it so that you get the privilege of doing it. Amen? Amen? Okay, some people get less excited when they have to, oh, I got to work? Yes. (laughs) It's a kingdom. Everybody works. Amen? It's a family business. Amen? The kingdom of God's family business is a wonderful thing. Okay, so God said it and it was done. He created the environment. And then in verse uh, 215... We look at what he gave to Adam. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to work it and to take care of it. And the Lord commanded the man, you are free. Everyone say, you are free. free. The first thing God told Adam is you are free. We were created for freedom. We were designed, our DNA is for freedom. That's what we were created for. Amen? That we're free. Now, freedom has some limitations, okay? You are free to eat from, the, from any tree. Um, let's see. I'm going to slow down. You are free to eat from any tree in the garden. But you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. For when you eat of it, you will surely die. Now, there's two things happening here. The first thing is God gave Adam a job. Men were made to work. Amen, men? I mean, you get a guy who's unemployed for too long, he gets kind of funky. It's better for him to volunteer, do something, Keep busy, because a man who's just kind of sitting home watching TV, he becomes weird. Because he's against his design. I don't care if he goes dig holes for free. He'll be better off. Okay? So the first, now single ladies, if you're single, if your guy doesn't have a job, he's not even, he's not material to be married. If he's in college, make sure he has a job. Because you don't know, he might graduate college and not work. Now, why did God give Adam a job first? Okay, it's a good thing, right? Well, you got to learn how to work. What do you learn? When you have a boss, you learn how to take orders, right? You learn how to say yes, sir, no, sir, right? You, you learn to do things you don't like to do, whether you want to do them or not. And now, what's interesting to me is the second thing God gave Adam is a limitation or a boundary. The first thing he gave him was a job. The second thing he gave him a boundary. He told them, you are free, but one tree. Now, why did God do that? See, Adam needs to know who he was. He was free, but he also needs to know who he wasn't. He wasn't God. 
He wasn't limitless. He had a boundary. And his boundary was in the context of obeying the Most High God. He's wonderful, but he's not God. And men struggle with being God. A lot of men like to be God. You know, me and my uh, son, and my son's matured past this point, but during his adolescence, we had a few conversations like, you know, Jubal, you know, what you're struggling with isn't what you're struggling with. What you're struggling with is you want to be God. You don't want anyone to tell you what to do. My job is to make sure that's gone before you leave my house. And every man knows exactly what I'm talking about. You've got to walk men through a process that they're not God. For some reason, it's just part of our psyche. Okay? But God went down, no, you're not God. I'm God, you're not. You're free, I'm God. And you got a job, get to work. Now, see, I'm taking you through kind of a little bit, but see, if I was reading the creation story, let's go back to the creation story. And I, and I read this, this part of the scripture. I forgot to read it earlier, but let me read it now. The Lord God says it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now, the Lord God formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field, and I'll get to that in a minute, brought them to the man, call, and whatever he would call them, whatever the man called them, living creature, that was its name. So the man gave names to all the livestock, the birds of the air, and the beasts of the field. But for Adam, no suitable helper was found. So the Lord God caused the man to fall into a deep sleep, and while he was asleep, okay, now, and while he fell asleep, he took one of the man's ribs and closed the place of flesh. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. Now, interesting to me, if you follow the creation story, God said it, and it was. So if it's not good for the man to be alone, I'll make a helper suitable for him. What should be the next verse? What should be the next verse? It was so. Boom, there's Eve. Right? Just like there was sky. Just like there was vegetables. Just like there was creatures. There should be Eve. But see, there's an exception to the principle. See, God was preparing Adam for marriage. Just because he was masculine didn't mean he was a man. This final creation of God had to go through a process. It wasn't instantaneous. See, Adam had to become a man of God. Adam had to become a servant man. That's why he got a job. Now, look at the job. This is really, really important. Because look at what Adam had to go through to become a servant man, to become a husband. Because marriage didn't happen until the servant was ready to receive it. Not the man, the servant. Let me walk you through what God did to Adam. Because what he did to Adam, he wants to do with every man and every woman, every time, to have an awesome marriage. Amen? Amen. The principles are right here. Okay, and I've read this hundreds of times and missed it. I literally, I would preach this, I would preach this, and I'd go from uh, 18, and I would skip 19, 20, and I'd go down to 21B. I'd just like, boop, go right over it. And one day God showed me, no, you're missing something, son. You ain't teaching this right. Now, when God tells you you're not teaching it right, you pay attention, amen? I said, okay, so teach me. So he did. It is not good for the man to be alone. I'll make a suitable helper for him. Now the Lord God formed out of the ground all the beasts of the field and all the birds of the air. Now why did he have to remind us this? It was in chapter 1. Okay? So he brought, because it wasn't finished. He made them, but he brought them to the man to see what he would name them. And whatever the man called them, each living creature, that was its name. See, God made the animals, but he didn't give them an identity. See, he gave Adam the DNA to give them identity. See, Adam had to learn a lot of things. First of all, he had to learn how to work. So the way this would show up is God would bring a tribe of peculiar animals every day to Adam's house. Get up, son, time to work. How many know God's early? <laughs> yeah, he's, he definitely has an early DNA. Okay? So he gets, gets up. Okay, Adam, get up. So Adam gets up, sits on his little rock or stool or whatever they had going on there in the garden, okay? And animal after animal would walk by Adam. And see, Adam had to learn that others were depending on him. See, these animals would come by, and he'd say, okay, aardvark, okay. Giraffe, 
Okay, okay. I have no idea what I'm going to name you. Come back tomorrow. <laughs> Go back to the end of the line. Uh, every day. Now, see, Adam didn't have an English training. Adam never spoke to another human being. He only spoke to God. He had to create every name. Now, how many animals are there? Just mammals. If you had a list of them, it would be a dictionary thick. And we've lost lots of them between now and creation. How many days do you think it took Adam to make that journey to name every single animal? It wasn't a day. Probably not a week. Probably not a month. Maybe several months, maybe several years. Every day with God. Every day with God. Every day with God. Men, you need to have every day with God. That's the foundation of marriage, is your relationship with him. If you don't have a, a foundational relationship with him, your marriage is going to suffer. Because that's the foundation of this triunity, is God's, man's relationship with God. Okay? So then, you know, and then he had to learn how others were dependent on him. So, like, there'd be this little creature, he came up, he came, <laughs> all excited. Because, see, animals were excited to see Adam. They wanted, it was like a lottery every day to go see Adam. Because before that, who are you? I don't know. The man hasn't told me. Who are you? He hasn't told me either. I don't know who I am. There was an identity crisis in the garden because nobody knew who they were because the one who needed to tell them was the man in the house. Had to tell them who they were. Now, men, you listen to me. Your voice to your children is the voice they need. They need mom's voice to say, yes, you're wonderful, amazing. But when you say it, they believe it. When you say you're beautiful, your daughters rise up. My daughter went to college. I wrote her a book. It's out there. I hand wrote her a letter every day to tell her who she was, what life is about. I just finished one with my son. And it's not printed yet, but it's, it just finished his letters because they need to know their dad speaks into their heart. That's my job on planet Earth is to speak strength and power and creativity and wisdom into them. That's my job. And if I fail at that job, my grandchildren pay. Because my, ch ch my son and daughter won't know who they are because their dad didn't tell them who they were. Amen, men? Amen, Amen. Amen men? Yes. I'll do it again. Amen, men? Amen. See, if you're unwilling to take your job in the kingdom, people suffer. See, if, if Adam didn't name an animal, it didn't have an identity. Now, what happened, though, this little creature with a little tail came up, got his name, and Adam said, Squirrel. <laughs> Squirrel! went crazy down the road. I'm squirrel, I'm squirrel, I'm squirrel. <laughs> and people would ask him, who are you? I'm squirrel. How do you know? The man told me I'm squirrel. I'm squirrel. <laughs> See, Adam had to learn that he wasn't here for himself. That he wasn't given life for himself. Yeah, enjoy the fruit, enjoy, enjoy life. But his purpose was to serve. And it wasn't to serve the, just the greater and to worship God. It was to serve the weaker. Every animal was inferior to him in every way. In intellect and capacity and language and skills, opposable thumbs. Yet every day, Adam had to get up and serve the squirrel and the chipmunk and the turtle and the giraffe and the coyote and the lion. And every day. For months and months and months and months and months and months and months. Okay, are you getting this? See, the process of marriage starts with the process of a man becoming a man of God. Amen. We serve a servant God, <laughs> don't we? He serves us. He came, he died for us, he laid his life down, he, he bled for us. And see, he had to create a servant man out of Adam so he could prepare him for his bride. Doesn't that sound familiar, church? Didn't Jesus come and lay down his life for what? His bride. Amen? Isn't it his voice that gives identity to his bride? Okay, so let me go on. Are you all learning anything? Y'all having fun? Okay, because see, what happens is if you don't understand how marriage is made, you might try to make it differently. You'll try to make it in your own image. It's not going to work if it's in your image. It has to be in his image. In his image, it works. 
And it's a process, okay? And so what happens is God was, God was bringing these herds to him day after day. God was giving him the responsibility to solve a problem, to be responsible, to have a good work ethic, to be creative day after day after day after day. See, God was creating a servant out of Adam so he could be able to be married. Because marriage is a daily job. Marriage is a huge responsibility. Marriage is something that takes a lot of hard work. Marriage is something you've got to show up every day. Paul reiterates this in Ephesians. What man doesn't care for his own body, love his own body, wash his own body, feed his own body. How often do you do that? Hopefully you do it every day. Otherwise you'll stink and you'll be skinny. <laughs> okay, there's consequences of not following the daily disciplines of life. There's consequences of the daily disciplines of marriage. Does that make sense? So God was making Adam understand daily disciplines are the way of life. You get up, you serve, you do what you need to do, and you get that right son. And when you get that right son, then he'll solve the problem, which was at the top of the, uh, in, in verse 19. I mean, verse, yeah, verse 18. The problem was it's not good for man to be alone. But Adam wasn't ready to be a husband yet. Right? God took him through a process. And when he took him through the process, then something beautiful really, really happened. See, God took Adam through the process. And every day, this herd of animals would show up. And God would step aside, sit down, have his little cappuccino, and watch Adam work. He never helped him. God never helped Adam. Now, women understand this. This is the way dads do it. They let them do it without helping them. Every guy knows what I'm talking about, right? Your dad didn't help you do stuff. He'd watch you do stuff. And if he didn't do it right, he might help you. Okay, but he wasn't going to do it for you. Now your mom, she's going to do it for you. And let you get credit for it. Okay, that keeps you weak. Okay? Men understand, no, if you want him strong, he's got to do it himself. Right? So God let Adam do it himself every day. He just watched in case, I think God just watched for the humor of it. <laughs> like, okay, yeah, aardvark, really? Aardvark? You came up with that by yourself? Aardvark? Wow. That's awesome, son. <laughs> you know, but he let him do it every day, go through the process, because he was creating a servant out of Adam. And see, so one day came, and Adam was probably already up, because by now he got up at 5 o'clock in the morning, because God got up at 5 o'clock in the morning. Okay, he's up, he's ready. But bring it on, Jesus. Bring it on, God. Come on. What you got today? And oddly enough, this day was unique because God was walking up the trail. But there wasn't this herd that was behind him, kind of scattering and walking and flying around. And he comes up to Adam, and he steps aside. And there she is, the most beautiful creature Adam has ever seen. There she is, Eve. Now see, how do I know that Adam was made a servant man by his reflex. His reflex was this. Then the Lord God made a woman from the rib he had taken out of the man, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, no, this is, well, i got to go back well, just a second. Let me go back. Okay, he caused the man to fall into a deep sleep. While he was sleeping, he took one of the man's ribs, and he closed up the place with flesh. See, God heals you. God didn't want the marriage on Adam's woundedness. He let him be whole. And if you've been abused, abandoned, neglected, or whatever, you have to heal that. Your spouse can't heal you. God has not put healing in them. He's put healing in himself. Okay? So then he brings the woman to the man. He brought her to the man, and the man said, instantly, instantly, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. The first thing Adam did was meet her need. The first thing he did is he saw her absence of identity. The first thing he did is he knew how to serve her because she needed to be served because that's why I'm here, is to serve her. He didn't say, oh, good, I got someone to enslave. I got someone to abuse. I got someone to tell what to do. I'm bigger. I'm stronger. That's right. If he had done that, God would have slapped him right upside the head. I guarantee you, pop. <laughs> because one thing he learned from his father is you're here to serve the lesser. 
those that don't have identity, those that have paws, those that have claws, those that have hooves, those that can't reason like you can reason, you're there to serve them. And when you understand you're here to serve, I'll bring you a woman because now you're ready because I've made you a servant man because I'm a servant God. And I had to take you through a process to understand my heart. I can make you a creature, but it's a process to make you a servant. Amen. For men and women. Now, it's interesting to me. You know, I travel all over the country and all over the world. It's interesting to me that women don't need this class. Most of them, now I'm not saying all of them, but most of them tend to have this natural disposition to serve. Everywhere I go, there's women in the kitchen, women in Sunday schools, women running around doing, there's serving. Why is it that women do not struggle with serving? See, I believe the answer is right here. Because see, woman wasn't taken out of man. She was taken out of a servant man. The servant DNA was already in Adam by the time Eve was taken from him. So she doesn't struggle with serving. She gets it. Now, sadly enough, men still struggle. We still struggle, okay? But see, God has shown us that if we will serve, if we'll take our job seriously, if we'll be a solution instead of a problem, if we'll humble ourselves and work that way, we'll arrive where he wants us to arrive. We'll arrive at a place where he can trust us and bless us and expand us. Because if you want to grow in the kingdom, you got to grow down to grow up. Amen? Amen. You can't be too good to. you got to be good enough to go in there and get your hands dirty. Now, you're, you're in a good church because your pastor's that kind of guy. He unlocks the door. He picks people up at the airport. He gets things done. You see Eric serving all over. So in this house, you have a servant DNA as a leader. Okay? So if you have that as you're in your home and you move that in your home, that servant DNA will change your marriage. See, if you're, if you're struggling in your marriage, oftentimes you're struggling to serve. So, no, it's about me. No, it's not about you. And I'm not going to be judging how well Lisa serves me, and she's awesome at serving me. I'm going to be judging how well I serve her. Now, see, God's not just your father. He's your father-in-law. <laughs> you got an all-knowing, all-powerful, almighty father-in-law God who's going to evaluate you at the end of the deal. And how well you do in your marriage is really important because it may determine the favor of God on your life. See, if you're treating your spouse poorly, who is his favorite daughter or his favorite son, how's God going to feel towards you? He's not going to like you. What do you mean he's not going to like me? Well, I have a daughter, and if she marries a guy and he treats her poorly, I'm not going to like him, whether he's saved or not. I'm not going to like him. Okay? Now, I have a daughter, and she marries a good guy, and he loves and serves her and blesses her. How am I going to feel towards him? Half the kingdom is yours. He will have my favor depending on how he treats her. Same with my daughter-in-law. She'll have favor depending on how she treats him. How many want the favor of God? See, the favor of God is when God gets really creative and messing with you in good ways. He blesses you beyond your abilities. He expands you beyond things. He gives you opportunities you can't see coming. I have that in my life all the time. And it's because I do dishes. It's because I do laundry. It's because I help around the house. It's because I don't have to be told what to do. He's like, oh, hey, look at how he loves her. And then he gives me a book idea. <laughs> I'll be driving my truck and God will download something to me. Because I did laundry. <laughs> laundry is the fastest way to get God's favor. <laughs> this is work. Laundry works. Mopping the floor works. That's why men are stronger and bigger. It's because we can serve better. You don't need to be in bed at 8 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. You're up at 5 anyway, so get up and clean the house. <laughs> then your wife has more energy for you at 8 o'clock at night. Okay, think about these things. Okay. Praise the Lord. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Well, I, I know that um, 
you're in a really good, you're in a really good house here. I'm really proud of you. And I'm going to turn it over to Pastor Eric here and, and uh, let him close. But I'm really proud of your, your family and what God is doing in your, in your life here and really excited. And um, I just pray that you will just continue to grow and take it to the next level because God is just starting with you guys. This party's just starting. He, first, he got the house ready so you can have bigger parties. Amen. Pastor Eric, come on up. I really appreciate the, the good word this morning, and it's a great word, and it's a great word because how many folks know in our society today there's been an attack upon marriage, there's also been an attack upon masculinity, and the role of a father, and the role of a man, and the role of a woman. And uh, as, as uh, Doug, uh, Dr. Doug said, he's talked about the fact that man gives the identity. And even, I don't know if you realize this, but even in biology, when the woman's chromosomes and the men's chromosomes come together, the defi- deciding factor is the male the father's genes, if your father's um, seed determines the identity if it's going to be a boy or a girl. So it's amazing that we have a responsibility to be servant leaders. And so, men, I, I want to encourage us, and I'm encouraged, not to be passive, but to be servants. And so God has called us to do that. But there's something else that's really interesting as well. It says the father gives the identity to the child. And maybe you didn't have a good father growing up. Uh, And maybe you don't know God. But you know what? God has has you here for a reason this morning. If you're watching online or if you're here right now, God has you here for a reason. And he wants to give you an identity. And that identity comes through Jesus Christ, who is called the second Adam. The first Adam messed up. Christ did what the first Adam did not do. He gives you an identity. And that identity is that you are his son or daughter. And maybe you don't have a good dad growing up. Maybe you never had a father that said anything good to you. Maybe you don't even know who your father is. Dr. Weiss did not know who his father was. How many people know? I mean, obviously you can tell he's a very secure, he's a masculine man. He knows his purpose. Why? Because he knows God the Father. That gave him an identity. So maybe you have a disadvantage growing up, and we understand that. But understand this, God is not here to have you stay at a disadvantage. He wants to give you the advantage of knowing Him so you can become a full man, a full woman, and a full person that He's called you to be, that you can help transform this earth one life at a time together. And so this only happens, really, the only way you're going to know the Father is you have to know the Son. And I don't know where you are. Maybe you believe in Jesus Christ. And, yeah, I believe in Jesus. Yeah, that's cool and everything. But listen, until you surrendered your life to Jesus, you are not really a believer. You're not really a Christian. You're, you're a follower. You, you like Christ. You're a fan of God. But until you hand over the keys of your life, say, I'm not the boss anymore. God is the boss. Until you give your life to Jesus, you're not saved. Religion doesn't save you. Scripture verses don't save you but sacrificing and surrendering your life to Christ and saying, I'm giving my life to you. I'm no longer the boss. I believe you are the son of God. And so I want to give you an opportunity today to do such. And let the Father place his DNA on you. Well, let's find out who you are today. Today can be the day where you can be the son or daughter of God. I'm going to ask you to bow your heads if you could be so kind. I'm going to pray a prayer right now. You pray it in the quietness of your heart. It's a new beginning. Lord Jesus, I want to thank you for dying on the cross for me. I believe you are the Son of God. I give my life to you today. I declare that I no longer live for myself, but I live for you, for you are the creator of me. I ask you to forgive me of all of my sins, both known and unknown. And from this day forward, with your help, I choose to walk the path you have for me. In Jesus' name, amen. It's every head, every bowed today. If that was you today and you prayed that prayer perhaps for the first time or or re-dead it, are you doing it again? Can I just see a quick show of hands just quickly so I know how to pray? Thank you. Appreciate that. Honestly, anyone else this morning say, you know what, Pastor, I want to let you know that I made a decision today. Anyone else? Thank you. I see that hand. Anybody else this morning? It's just what it's all about, man, to know the Father. So thank you for that. I want to pray for some others of you this morning as well. I'm going to ask the um, prayer team to make their way up. And some of you just don't know. You just don't feel like you have an identity. I want to let you know a couple of things this morning. If you're alive today,
God loves you. And so the Father wants to say to you this morning that I love you, that I have a purpose for you. You're my daughter. You're my son. I love you. Don't let anyone say anything else than that. You're beautiful before him. You are, you are a winner in Christ Jesus. Everyone who's in Christ Jesus is a winner, ultimately. So know who you are in God. I'm going to ask, it's such a great song, He Loves Me. So we could all stand, we could do that, please. I also want to pray for, if you need prayer for anything at all, we want to encourage you to come down. Go ahead, Esteban, you'd be so kind. Jesus, He loves me. This morning, and I just want to. I forgot to do one more thing. Two things I want to do before we leave today. If you'd be so kind, I'm sorry to make you sit down again. Would you mind sitting down just one more, just a few minutes? I appreciate it. A couple of things. First of all, we want to be able to sow into the ministry of marriages here at Cornerstone Church. We want to continue to do events like we had this past weekend. We want to have more events to help marriages, to help families. And so we like to do at this point is have a collection that you would sow into the ministry of our marriage ministry at Cornerstone Church. You know, it costs money to bring in people like Dr. Wise because we believe it's a worthy investment. So we want to go ahead and do that. So, Father, I just pray that you bless uh, this, this offering today as we continue to invest in marriages in Jesus' name. Amen. Go ahead, ushers, you can do that. And also, go ahead, guys. Also, I wanted to bring to your, your attention as well. We, we're so delighted this morning. To have Hector Rodriguez is here this morning. Hector, where's Hector? Can you show, show your hand real quick? There's Hector Rodriguez, Kate Gavigan. Hector Rodriguez is a minister. He's, he's deaf, and he ministers to those that cannot hear. Kate Gavigan has been going for a number of years to Santo Domingo, and that's, that's, that shares the same island of Haiti. And what they do is they reach out to those that cannot hear. They reach out to the least of these. In fact, Kate is going back, I believe, again, to have a special camp for deaf children that they could hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And they give their lives to Christ. They're encouraged. And so this is a wonderful ministry. And they have a table in the lobby. We want to encourage you uh, as you leave today to visit them and but it's just a blessing. Thank you, Hector. It's an honor. This is his first time in the United States. So make sure you're extra nice so he comes back. <laughs> All right. Good to see you. And uh, so we want to bless you today. Thank you for being attentive. Today we have 301. You're more than welcome to come. We have extra food this morning at 301. If you're part of Cornerstone Church and never went, we'd love to have you come. All right. Let's go stay one more time. Sorry about that. Stay one more time. And let's just conclude with one, the chorus of He Loves Me, and then we'll conclude, okay? Let's go ahead. Jesus, He loves me. He loves me. He is for me. Jesus, how can Bless you, may keep you, may he shine his faith upon you, give you grace and peace. 
God bless you today. You're, you're free to go. You're dismissed. If you'd like to have prayer, we'd love to pray for you. God bless you.